to Avtex and the different areas that you worked at Avtex, American Viscos? Uh, did you want to go all the way through it then? Okay. Do you want to, do you need a break first? Oh, are you ready? Whenever you're ready, sir. Okay, I'm fine. Okay, go ahead. I'm Hal Meredith. I came to American Viscose out of the Army and worked for following World War II. I had spent four years overseas in Europe at that time, all the way from the Battle of Normandy all the way to Central Europe, Czechoslovakia. When I was discharged in July, the Army Referral Service sent me to American Viscose for employment. But in the meantime, the wife, we were not married before I went overseas. And so we, she waited four years till I got back. We were married and came to work at American Visco's Labor Day, 1945. I went to work in this spinning department, box spinning as a doffer. I also swept about that whole planet one time or another. From there, while well, we moved up through the different uh, jobs in, within the spinning department, 1952, I became an assistant shift foreman at the Kirby Peak Division. From there, I became a shift foreman in the staple department. <clears throat> and then we moved along several years, and I then became staple department head. Then we went back to spinning the spinning department head. And after that, in the later five or six years, I was at uh, then Avtex, I was the manufacturing superintendent of fibers for the plant. I retired due to disability, having had a hip replaced and then a knee had worn out. In May of 1980, I put in 30, well actually 82, 37 years. Since you worked at several of the different departments and also managed them, do you mind going into some detail about the product that you made and uh, how it was made in some of the different areas? In box spinning, the big item at, uh, at that time was tire cord. It's probably the greatest tire fabric tire cord that ever was uh, patented. When I first went there, we were still supplying the military. After a few years, well, it became sharp, became uh, unnecessary for the military, so we then came out with our research people and came up with more spectacular tire cords, which kept the market going for a number of years. From there, I went over to the continuous spinning, continuous filament. Now, in, in that department, it's still the same viscose process with sulfuric acid, which produced rayon. But one of the main products out of that department in later years was uh, fibers for the nose cones of the uh, various spaceships and things of that order. Then I went on up to the staple department, and up there we made an extremely high quality, high priced uh, fiber. Now this fiber was spun in long continuous ropes and uh, was then cut to prescribed length by rotary cutters. And this is very critical. Each shift while you sized up the lengths coming from those cutters, because if they exceeded the lengths then your customers got into trouble with their weaving. And they let you know it in a great big hurry. We made everything from quarter inch, which was used uh, in that place of silk and money, all the way up to uh, six inch, which was used for various other products. Some of these items went into draperies, expensive draperies, rugs, and this sort of thing. <clears throat> then we get over into the area where I was looking after the manufacturing part of the plant and then we're into this thing of making viscose, spinning production, shipping production, scheduling and planning and all this sort of stuff. 
And at that point, I retired. I might add, just one thing that always struck me about the uh, uh, rayon plant, I don't care whether it's Avtex or American Viscose, it was always a friendly, family type operation. Everybody seemed to get along with everybody. Labor and management, their problems were practically non-existent. We had a union, a union business agent, it knew if we didn't turn a profit, his people weren't going to work. And the same thing we recognized back to them. Now, I worked both as a union member and as a member of management, so I saw both sides of it, set across the tables on both sides. Could you talk a little bit about the management styles that were prevalent during the era, some of the nuances of running a factory, uh, some of the things such as industrial psychology. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about what the work was like, what went into the work, how you did your job? I guess one of the greatest things uh, as far as management is concerned is being able to provide leadership to teach other people to be leaders. Some of the work in uh, this manufacturing process was, uh, was not under the best conditions. But let me quickly add that safety was a primary concern. We had uh, professional safety programs. We had testing going on constantly for air quality in the work areas. In the lower deck of continuous spill, uh, filament, it would get hot in the summertime, it would exceed 100 degrees. However, these ladies worked there. If you got into a problem, they would double over to help out and to get out of the problem. And I, I go back to this thing of leadership. And some people are fortunate enough that they are born with it, call it common sense if you want. Now, this is one thing that you learn by doing or you have it naturally. Common sense is not taught in any university, any high school, anywhere that I know of. And I think this is a way you get along with people. This is a way you direct people. What type of training did you receive in preparation for your work with Avtex or did they train you on the job? Train, on the job training pretty much all together on the job training. I went to a number of, uh, of uh, in-plant school sessions, if you will, in the various elements. I uh, had a course with correspondent schools in leadership and foremanship and things like that. But other than on the job and, and uh, knowing by doing, I had no formal education in this direction. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you worked with Calvin Fox. Could you talk a little bit about the people that you worked with and what it was like there, what they were like? What well, in the staple department, Calvin Fox was a staple engineer. In other words, in that department we had a chemical, a chemical group we had the engineering group and, of course, the production group. We worked very closely together. Now, Calvin was an excellent engineer, and his uh, early training was heavy equipment, earth moving and things like that. But Calvin and I walked the floor many night out there with breakdowns and spent the night with them until we finally reconciled them. It was always easy to get engineering people in during the middle of the night. They always seemed willing to help out. Of course, they were getting a time and a half, double time, things like that. But uh, Calvin provided real leadership to the engineering group. Now, under him was Garth Payne and Earl Hawkins. Uh, they were uh, for, day foreman, if you will, in charge of various areas around the spinning of the staple department. You go back to the spinning department. It'd be hard to see how you get along without the likes of Jimmy Colbert and uh, and uh, several of the other people like that. 
They just provided the know-how and the backbone. I tried to provide leadership. Of course, in the early days, I had a broom in my hand more often than anything else. But I guess after World War II, I probably swept about every inch of that plant when I first went there. Uh, the top management, you couldn't ask for better people to work with you, Al Rupp. Uh, and uh, Eldon Camel and all those various plant managers they were easy to get along with. They knew uh, they provided leadership. They knew you had problems. They'd help you overcome them. It's just a real nice atmosphere to work there. And let me add one other thing that's not generally known. They provided their employees with the best benefits that you can find anywhere. Since I've been retired, I've never been able to buy insurance. Health insurance would even come close to what they provided, such as medication for two, three dollars a prescription, uh, hospitalization. They paid it all, and I've just never found any place that I could get benefits to, that we worked under at uh, Avtex and American Vista Coast. A lot of people were involved in other activities aside from work uh, during their time there at the plant. Um, could you talk a little bit about the social life, the uh, things that outside of the regular work day? Could you? Uh, we, there were a lot of company parties. Uh, we also had a baseball team many years ago when I first went there. It's uh, it quite a baseball team. They played in an inner plant league, if you will, along with other people. Be surprised how many of those guys wound up in the major leagues. But through the years, you had these various uh, departmental parties. Everybody got together, picnics, had a good time. <clears throat> and then as the group got a little bit older, there were the 25-year parties. Now, these are what everybody looked forward to. They handed out a bunch of watches went over to the wayside in Middletown and you just had a real good group of people and the wayside at that time provided a country style dinner is just out of this world they had ham chicken turkey you name it it's on the table but uh, each one of those gatherings 25 year parties is probably at least a hundred people in each and every one of them and Agnes Rutherford pretty much pulled them together, who she was a manager sec uh, secretary. And it was just a great big good time there. Th this whole thing through the, well, almost 40 years I was there, you had problems. You had problems that you think going to drive you off your rocker, but it never did. And But all in all, it was just a, a good place to work. It's hard to believe in later years that the critics of they have Texan American Viscos. Obviously, they don't know what they're talking about. What are some of the problems that the equipment that you had maintaining and fixing the equipment? What, what went into uh, having one of these break down? What, could you talk about what happened? Uh, many years ago, that plant was closed down completely for a week twice a year and everything known to be a, in a, a problem, mechanical uh, problem was repaired. You started up and you ran without trouble. Clear on to the next six, the next six months uh, shut down. However, through the years it gradually worked away from that and so, to some extent ran breakdown maintenance if you will. Now FMC was in there and I was staple department head at the time and you had seasonal periods when you didn't uh, have full production and people would be laid off and the equipment was standing there idle. Well, this is a time you used to get in there and repair this stuff. FMC, Mr. Meredith, don't spend five cents on that equipment while it's down. Shut down, we'll fix it and we start up. Well, this was the beginning of your problems, but in any event, you're talking about well, we had a fire there once, and the whole place was shut down about a month. And uh, this was a very unusual situation. The fire was in the air ducts, uh, supplying the plant and exhausting the plant. But uh, 
a stable department, for example. You had 10 production lines there, each about a city block long. And you would get into problems in the dryers. Now, these dryers were probably 100 feet, well, 200 feet long, and they were drying fiber all the way. But okay, they would catch fire sometimes, and it was a real frightening thing because the your lint, your dust around there and everything would just almost explode. Well, the sprinkler system and safeguards, and we had a fire crew that was well trained. We had fire drills at least weekly. They'd have those fires out pretty quickly with the, along with the plant fire department. But uh, the cleanup behind those things and the mechanical repairs, some of those items you uh, had to go through there through all this old burnt staple, old wet burnt staple out. And it takes several hours to get going again. Another thing to those big staple dryers, this was a long stainless steel conveyor in there. And these have been known to hang up. And when they did, they just buckled and tore themselves up. And this is where Calvin used to come in, get his cheap metal people and other people in there. And they'd work 24 hours to get this thing going again. And that happened, wasn't an everyday occurrence, but it happened. And uh, you had uh, transporting aprons, spiked aprons in, these, in this equipment. They would hang up sometimes. You'd have to replace them, which was all day. But those were some of the most common things. Uh, other times you'd get in trouble in the powerhouse. And in spinning rayon, you were passing uh, viscose through spinnerets in a sulfuric acid bath. And if there's the least hesitation of any kind that breaks that continuity, you are down. So if the powerhouse hiccuped, the whole plant was down. And it took hours and people to get that going again. It's just the double that uh, continuous filament, for example. If that was down, it took a, a day, a full day to ever get it going again once you were repaired and ready to go. Wow. Turn it off for just a minute. On, are you? Oh, I turned it back on. Okay. Light. And then we get into all the mechanical problems and you go to the real core of the matter named Jim Morgan. Now Jim when you went in with a problem, would immediately pick up the phone. So he had to move the phone out of his reach before you could really get going on what your problem might be. But I've all respect to Jim Morgan. He did a whale of a job. He helped you out if he possibly could. At times, I couldn't see how the man could survive snowed under as he was. But uh, he, he provided real service. His people were well trained. They did a wonderful job. Can you think of anything else at this point that you could elaborate on? Any details about the plant, making viscose, any stories that you can add? I'm sure there are a whole lot of them. I don't come up with anything right at the moment okay. that would be good to you. What do you do with those black spots? Cut them out. Yeah. Uh, how how did you feel? You were retired when they closed the oh, plant. Oh yeah. What was your reaction to the closure? Uh, I think, like all of us, it's a little bit emotional. I know they announced a time and a date to demolish the stack, and. I was there falling the fire when they had to rebuild that stack and a whole lot of effort went into it, but the stack was kind of the landmark, this is where the plant is. In spite of what all people might say, this was the plant, provided uh, a lot of education, college education, built a lot of homes, but as I said, people coming in a little bit later were very, very critical. But you know, uh, as I touched on a little earlier, working in the plant, 
we were not that concerned about safety or the smell. The smell outside was not necessarily in the plant, it was blown out. But uh, I lost my trend of thought. Did a lot of people get sick or anything? Critics toward the end and the smell. No. Uh, when they were getting ready to close the plant down, uh, Jack Mallison and I went to about all of the hearings in Richmond. I was retired at the time. And uh, the state attorney general had said she was going to close it down. About that time, they let uh, an explosion in the electrical system turn some PCBs loose, which found their way into the river, and that was the straw that broke the camel's back. But uh, when they were went to blow the stack, I sat out here on the front walk, which I could see easy enough over to plant. And they were right on schedule, 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, the stack started moving, falling, and then came the boom after traveling the distance from over there over here. And I felt bad about seeing that. I didn't get emotional or anything, but it made you depressed. But just all the friends and uh, the fact that you are where you are and the wherewithal to live secure in retirement, that all came from there. And uh, one more time, you cannot ever find the benefits financially, health wise, that you found that they provided in that plant. The American Viscos and Avtex were good to their people. Olive had a gallbladder operation after they closed the plant. And I was looking at $13,000 bill. John Gregg paid it. And this is the sort of thing that you ran into. It wasn't all bad, all black as people picture it now. I've been in the environmental community for 60 years or more. And I wore two hats at one time. And I'd get into these uh, meetings with uh, people from outside the county, uh, the friends of the North Fork, for example, and people like that. Well, how, how can you justify standing up for American Viscoats? I said, well, item one, they uh, provide a lot of education and they have uh, built a lot of homes. But uh, the biggest thing of all, they came there, there were no restrictions whatsoever. Everything, all the affluent went into the river. Then they uh, started making amends for this. They spent uh, $10 million on a secondary waste treatment. They had built a primary waste treatment. Then for the air, they put in a bag house to filter the uh, fluent from the from the smoke from the boilers for 11 million none of this stuff contributes one penny to profit but they went this far to try to uh, amend the pollution situation now basically you get down to one thing people pick up their morning newspaper and then glory in it every morning same process making rayon you ever go into town smell a paper plant you ever look at the river blow a paper plant just a, so it's somewhat in the same ball game. It's a hard matter to make rayon and not have some pollution. I don't condone pollution at all. For example, we had a fish kill out here in the 1950s and uh, an environmental uh, group, I was running down the river there counting fish and insisting that plant make amends financially along with a whole lot of other people and they did but they never once criticized me for being on the other side and they never did all through the years. And I was never against the plant, but when they messed up, I was there to say, look, you've got to fix it. Can I turn it off for a minute? Could you talk a little bit about your service, your war service and experience? Hmm. Okay. Uh, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, I was sitting on the front gate of Fort Holliburg in Baltimore in an MP outfit. And this was uh, actually a 
motor school, the motorized school, and this is where the Jeep was developed. And following uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor in, in December, we headed to England then in April, probably as a backup uh, to the British Army to keep them from, uh, to keep the Germans from coming to, into England. While we were there, while we were there, we were employed hauling, stacking 500 pound bombs uh, along those country roads before Normandy, uh, you travel miles and miles and miles. It's just stacks of bombs piled by these country roads in England. Out in the fields, there are just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres of tanks and guns and weapons carriers and half tracks, things like that. And then, of course, people started, troops started pouring in there. When we first went there, we were about the only troops in England. In fact, we were on British Army rations. We didn't have supplies of our own. Were you in the Army? Huh? Were you in the army? Which branch? Were you drafted? Yeah, but in any event, uh, it's fine being on British Army rations and supplies if you like mutton and Brussels sprouts. Because every morning you had what to call porridge and prunes for breakfast and mutton and Brussels sprouts for lunch and the same for the evening meal. Then everybody, all this equipment's on here and all these uh, troops were in there, then the Normandy invasion came off. We had thought having been there for two years, we'd probably go home instead of going to France, but this wasn't the way it worked out at all. Uh, we landed in Normandy four days after the initial invasion. It was, uh, we pulled up in a Liberty ship off the beach at night and it's really a sight to see. In the distance, everywhere you look are flashes of light from the artillery firing. And uh, this was it till the next morning. We went down offside the ship on rope ladders and into landing craft. Really is a scene, a little bit of devastation around there. And there were ships sunk lying on their side, landing craft lying and in sunken in the water, tanks that had been let go in too deep a water and you had to kind of wind your way among them. You get on the beach, you burned out tanks, burned out weapons, carriers, jeeps, all that stuff. And they had pretty well cleaned up forest personnel on the beaches. But uh, here and there, you'd see a soldier rolling in the surf and uh, gently rolling in the surf that they had not gotten around to. We went on, the German army at this time was anywhere from just off the beach to four or five miles inland. We uh, then proceeded off the beach into an apple orchard to dig in for the night. We ran a half track around there first to explode any mines that might be there. Here's where we lost our first man, a fellow Joe Castellina from Pennsylvania, Jerry, when they left, it hung a Luger pistol in an apple tree and he rushed over to get it. And we picked him up. It's just like a bag of potatoes, it's booby trap. Uh, the battle for Normandy lasted until August the 28th. My service record says that I was in Normandy from June the 10th to August 28th, and then to northern France. And at this time, when they broke through at St. Lo on the morning of the 25th of July, the bombers started coming over. We were a couple of miles from St. Lo, but there were 2,500 bombers in there at one time. They were circling from England to St. Lo, bombing the German army. The bad part of it, the smoke shifted and they killed 410 of our people plus the commanding general, General McNeil, McNair. Then we moved, moved on from there towards central France, towards Le Mans, and on through that area. We were running along pretty good. We had joined with the Third Army at that time. And we went on through central France in the fall of the year, rains everywhere, into the Battle of the Bulls there in, in the winter time, close to Christmas. And that was a good place you could freeze to death, and a lot of them did. And from there to Central Europe, where 
between Nuremberg and uh, Czechoslovakia. We ran into a concentration camp. The Jerry's had just pulled out. And here were just great piles of bodies in it, machine gun, everything in there, women, children. <coughs> So I have a army buddy, Ernie Gill, who spent Christmas with us, he and his wife, 50 some years. He had pictures of this, but they confiscated them when he was discharged. So I thought maybe I'd get my hands on some of them, but I did not know why I wanted them. We had some people who were taken from Dachau. They, of course, a little bit malnourished and things like that. And then the war ended. Prior to that, the German soldiers around on the street had thrown their guns down and all what we knew was practically over. They had to make a formal announcement. So I came home. We came home quickly after the war. We had been there for four years. And they took us on the southern route, which was through southern France, Marseille, to Casablanca, to the car, Central Africa, to Natal, Brazil, to, to British uh, Guiana and Northern South America, and uh, into Miami, Florida. There I reached home, was discharged on the 25th of July. Ollie was still waiting there for four years. So we got married and I went to work at American West Coast on Labor Day, 1945. Did the American Viscos recruit you from the Army? The Army, yes. The Army recommended American Viscos. That's actually what happened. But yes, I'm sure they had that set up to do that. And you mentioned that you were from Culpeper, but you relocated to Front Royal. When I came back from World War II, we came to Front Royal just because of employment over here. and. Uh, Olive's sister and her husband were here. Olive, this is Sandy Flynn. <coughs> Hi, Olive. yeah, how are you? I talked to her on the phone. Yes. When is it? Oh, we week ago. <coughs> She's the one that said you had pneumonia. Yeah, I had I'm a real dose of it, too. Cigarettes. <coughs> I haven't had a cigarette in a day and a half. Oh, I oh. quit smoking them. You make me cough. Yeah, we'll do it. It's yeah. worth it. I know I smoked for years. Maybe I should cut this off for a minute. Whenever you feel ready, if you could say your name and whether you want to begin before Avtex, if you want to start uh, with the story of how Avtex came here. And what you had said earlier about that everything was dead before Avtex came. That was interesting. Uh, kind of puts the well, whole plant. I'm just, I'm just thinking as to whether I should use the last for the first, but no, I can't. Um, well, let's start. I, okay. I, I won't think. You can close, we'll go ahead and close that. Okay. If you could say your name, sir. And I'm Edgar R. Baldwin. Later years at the plant, I was known as the chief. Of course, I was chief quality control coordinator. I graduated from high school in 1939. College was not in the works for me at that time. In the work very few jobs in this area in which a high school graduate could work. So I enrolled in a business school studying 
Business Administration. That was 1939, right after I graduated. In the early 1940, I had a call from the American Bisco asking me if I would be interested in considering working with American Bisco. I did not know anything about American Visco. I only knew that a lot of local business and community people had worked hard to bring the plant to Warren County. Jobs were very scarce and people would need to go to Washington or move away from the area to get jobs. So I went to work for American Bisco. I was the first employee in the cake converting department. That is production employee. I stayed in the cake converting department doing various jobs until September 1942, at which time I enlisted in the United States Coast Guard during World War II. I came back, I was discharged from the Coast Guard in March 1946. and went back to work for American Fisker. The school that I received my diploma from contacted me and told me they would place me in a field of business. But at that time I was just happy to be back home since I was a native of Warren County so I went back to the plant. The same year I married my wonderful wife Anna, who was a school teacher. We lived across the mountain in Rappahannock, where she taught school, and I drove to work with some other people. And then in 1949, we built the home that we're now living in and stayed here. I stayed with the Cape Converting Department until I think it was uh, about 1948. And I was asked if I would consider a transfer to the technical department. They were starting up a new section, a quality control section. So again, I felt that that was a, another opportunity to, to advance, so I went to work with the technical department in the con quality control section. I just realized that the product is, was bound by specifications from start to finish. And one element of the quality control was to assist in monitoring this product through its entire production. I remained in this area doing various assignments until 1964 when I was put in the TT lab or physical testing lab as supervisor. This was again 
a challenge and a new experience for me. Uh, later that title was changed to Chief Quality Control Coordinator, but titles don't mean a lot, it's the work. The physical testing laboratory was an active beehive. There were two sections, one the yarn section, the other staple section. The yarn section we called the wrong strain. The staple section was known as the short strain. Now the yarn section tested the product that came from the box shop and doubled it, which was the continuous film yarn. And there were just numerous tests that were applied to this product again. Everything based on specifications. When the tests were completed, a grade was assigned to the product by the physical testing laboratory. And the product was made available for shipment. The staple section was much different. <coughs> Here we dealt with product that was cut from, well most of it was cut from one and an eighth inch to two inches in length. And sometimes really we had to cut staple to a quarter of an inch for the paper trade. And we, the technicians dealt with staple in some instances by testing a single filament. And a filament is much smaller than a sewing thread. So there were skilled technicians. Plus in the staple section we dealt with uh, tests such as uh, length if the specification said you should cut it at one and an eighth inch because that's what the customer wanted and demanded we had to measure it and see that it was cut to the proper length specifications on whiteness So we had color master units that we measured color whiteness. Staple, as well as yarn, had soft finish applied to them because any of the product in the rough was very abrasive and you couldn't work with it. So we applied finish. So we analyzed to see that it had the proper amount of finish. Then a very critical thing to us was a lot, a lot of the product was guaranteed for dye. So we ran what was known as the blue dye test. When we say guaranteed for dye, we have to guarantee that the dye cannot ship with a certain man within, let us say, a, a year because if the customer would take a bail and it was at a different dial level and put it in, most of this product went into blends with cotton. We would end up with streaks in the yarn and the product and had a healthy complaint. So that was one of the most critical tests that we could run. And then in the spinning process, the spinnerets uh, might get dirty or for some reason two filaments might be stuck together and we would uh, 
come up what what was known as a splinter. So we ran carding tests in which we would take X number of pounds of staple, put it through a carding machine, and then count the defects in a pound of staple, realizing that zero defects was not there, but you did have limits for which you went by. Then two, we ran sterile absorbent staple for Johnson and Johnson, which probably the general public knows nothing about. But we furnished a lot of the, quote cotton for pillbox stuffing. It wasn't cotton; it was rayon. And the sterile whiteness on that was very critical. So that was a, another element of testing. Then also we made uh, a crimp staple. Most staple is straight, but crimp. Let's say it might have to have 10 inches of crimp per inch. So that was specifications and was made and we would check. So then another critical item in staple was uh, moisture content of the bed of staple. Couldn't be too wet, couldn't be too dry. Very strictly controlled. And we had two, what was known as forte units in the plant. Prior to that, we used Emerson ovens where we would take a certain amount of staple, put the Emerson oven and dry it and weigh it and come up with the moisture content. But with the advent of the Forte unit uh, and through calibration, through the Emerson oven and constant calibration, we could run a bale of staple through and get it rated and look at a chart that we had devised for the staple department then establish some moisture on the bale and put the weight Ready. We could go on and on on testing, but uh, the bottom line of it was that uh, staple had to meet and yarn standards and specifications before it could be released for shipment. And as far as the staple concerned, in many cases, we not only tested and released the staple, we selected the bales for various customers, and told them when to ship and how to ship. So it went on quite a ways. Now the yarn section worked on a five-day week. However, the staple section worked on a rotating ship, just like the plant. Do you mind saying that again? Could you say that one more time, please? So we had people doing tests around the clock every day of the week that the plant was operating. I guess that's enough for the staple side. I could say. Uh, which had Monday through Friday and which had rotating shifts? The plant rotated, four rotating shifts. You would, one shift would work from 7 to 3.30, the other 3.30 to 12, the other 12 to 7. There was four shifts. One shift was always on break, you see. And that's the way the plant operated. So the PT the staple section of the PT lab operated the same way as the plant. So you had people testing around the clock. Around the clock. I will end with that there. If any questions later, we will try to answer them, but 
I would say my experience with the plant was very interesting. I had many as other employees. Long days, short nights, probably no weekends, and many, many, many night calls. But I accepted it as part of the job and felt not bad about it. I consider it that the, the plant people, we might say we were a family. Each person had a job to do and I think they did it to the best of their ability. They realized that it was very important that we get as much A quality product as possible. Wasn't much market for all quality. So the push was to keep the quality level high and people work towards that. So I have to, I have to say that, that uh, the people that I'm associated with friendly and nice and I consider them friends and part of the family. A native of Warren County, I could have I'm sure with the help of the school, been in other places, but I just chose to stay here. But Anna and I, with her teaching school and me working, we raised three wonderful daughters, built a home, been active in the community. Her children all received good education. I guess you might say we had to plan a lot to do that, but anyway, we accomplished it. And we have lived our life in Warren County, and we're happy. And I would say that that. Um, I retired in 1984, but I was only off about a month or two months when I was asked if I would come back and do special project work at my leisure. I couldn't work with so many hours because of interfering with Social Security. So I did that and enjoyed that. In fact, I was still working on special project when the plant closed in 1989. So I guess I could say I was there when it started and I was there. Sorrowful to say for the plant and the plant people when it ended. Life has been good and we just have to that we have lived in Warren County. I will say I was born in 1922, so you could judge my age as long as we have, and we have a nice home and enjoy what we're doing. Could you talk a little bit about what the community and the atmosphere was before Avtex was even known to be relocated to be coming here. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the social, what people did, talk about life before Avtex and then after? 
well, it was limited. I can say my point. Uh, I, I was raised on a farm. In fact, over this, my house is located on part of the farm that I helped to farm when I grew up. So, uh, to my knowledge, around Front Royal, I remember the silk mill was in operation. Uh, but I really, agriculture was strong in Warren County back in the, the late 30s. And of course, uh, that was following the Great Depression. Uh, I just really don't know of any sizable industry around in which you could go to get employment. So life was dramatically changed for Warren, Front Royal and Warren County, and I would say Rappahannock and Page and Shenandoah and Frederick when Amtex moved into this area because I know I worked with people from all of those counties. In our lab we had people was driving quite a distance to work at Amtex from Page County, from Rappahanna County, Shenandoah County. At one time even they had a, a bus running from Page, there was a bus coming from Shenandoah, and there was a bus coming from Rappahanna. And they came every shift, bringing employees from those areas to work at the plant. So, on the basis of that, I would say that jobs were not too plentiful in, in the areas around us during that time. It was, well, tough to say it was a plus, and I have nothing but positive things to say about it. Do you know, um, do you remember any of the talk of the day? Uh, were people very eager to have Avtex come here? Do you remember um, it, any reports from the government meetings about trying to bring Avtex here? Do you remember no, anything I'm not. about it? I could not. If Aftex had not come here, uh, do you think you may have chosen farming or...? No, I would have chosen business, some form of business, of whatever the school would have rallied me to. No. I love the country, and I love farming, but not only it's hard work, it's one of the biggest gambles that the country because of the weather and things like that, so no. I guess what I'm getting at is what was the mindset of the, the community, the people that lived here? I noticed a lot of people moving from farming into the industrial age, working in factories rather than farms. Right. Could you talk a little bit about how we evolved from being basically farmers to moving into the factories. What was that change like to, to go through? Well, I think the, 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 it just became very hard to make a living farming. Uh, dry weather and uh, low prices for products that you raise, cattle prices were low, and things like that. So it, it was just hard to make a living and pay your taxes. So really, a lot of the people on the farms were looking for some way to better their life. And during the early part of the uh, plant life, there were a lot of people on farms went to work at the plant and still farmed, realizing that they just could not make a go of it 
or I, I, I couldn't say make a go, but not make a living that they would like to have by just working on the farm. You're, this was before a lot of mechanical machinery was on the area. Farming was done by horses, slow. So I could see that, that people, certainly younger people, were looking for a different way of life. And I guess I, I would have been one of them because I could not have seen myself trying to make a living and uh, educating daughters uh, on a farm income. It wasn't there. Do you think the depression uh, had an effect on people needing to get to Oh yeah, work? I'm sure the depression, and along with the depression there was a drought for years that uh, the farmers just lost. Yeah, it seems like you had to have money to, to be living after a while because property taxes didn't used to be that high. No, but you know, the, the thought was, was that uh, farmers didn't need money. They raised everything they needed to eat. Well, but Farmers have expenses just like everybody else, for the sakes. Food is just a small portion of what it costs to live. Can you think of anything that uh, you feel like you'd still like to talk about, about the plant? Uh, or before the plant got here? Well, I could go back and talk about the plant as far as, again, I would say that uh, I had a lot of interesting experiences because I did travel quite a bit for the plant. Uh, visiting, there's one I know I've told people before that I think I've been fussed at in every cotton mill in the South because uh, many times I would be sent to a mill to check on a complaint. Uh, the customer didn't like the product they received. And, I know many times it kid me to say, well, now you send it to them, now go down and correct it or something, you know. And so that was quite an experience. I met a lot of people in my travels through various big uh, cotton mills, from J.P. Stevens and Burlington. And I've cured all those mills. And caught a lot of airplanes and missed a lot. <laughs> so, and I, I even recall one thing I thought about this uh, <clears throat> back before I went into service, I, I remember the blackouts they had at the plant. But all the lights, of course, uh, normally if you would see the plants, you could look if you were flying over, you could just spot everything. But I remember times when there were no lights. So, I guess as you as you think and ramble and um, think back to experiences, um, and I guess tomorrow I will think of more things. <laughs> but I'm sure. A lot of people will come up with uh, many different thoughts about uh, plant life. Yes, I'd like to step back and get the bigger picture of, well, people visiting the museum uh, 
have been born into the time, the school children, that everything came from the grocery store, and we don't really make our own clothing anymore. We, we really buy everything that we have use. Um, to reflect a bit about how life itself uh, has changed, how, maybe how people's philosophies or views, uh, any, any differences that you've noticed um, from, say, the 40s and the 50s to today, this 50-year time period, how is the quality of life? Has it remained the same? Is it different? Well, uh, people say they like the good old days, but I sometimes think the good old days are now. Uh, just where we live right now, I remember when, when we moved here in 1949. I raised two or three pigs a year to butcher. I had probably 25 chickens for eggs. I had a milk cow down the road on a farm. So that was the life then. Many years ago, we got out of all of that work. Uh, of course, then we had a big garden. We can. And one of the first things that we purchased uh, when we moved here was a deep freeze. Came from Sears and Roebuck, which was at that time on Main Street in Front Row. And we froze everything that we could freeze. So life was changing already. And then, recall when the girls were young and the doctor says you must give them orange juice. We squeezed orange juice. We didn't have frozen orange juice. So life has changed, but I think it has changed for the better. <laughs> what was um, oh, let's see. That was good. Um, oh, I don't know what to ask you now that I've spoken with Ed Forsett. I don't want to get in the way of your story. <laughs> Could you talk some more? <laughs> Could you please tell more <laughs> about anything that you feel is important? <laughs> well, as far as the area is concerned, when we built the house here in 1949, my brother Smith built the house across the road at the same time. We were the only houses in this area. Now we have a big subdivision done yet right around in the fields in which we farm. It's all in lots. This house is being built across the highway from us which was it's been known as uh, the East Side Highway Route 340 now Stonewall Jackson Highway. So you know things are, they're just growing up. Traffic what we built was very few cars, and now it, it seems to be the last check I heard just recently that there's something like 7,000 cars a day using this highway. Trucks and all, plus the, the now talking about uh, improving the road. And if it goes by the plan that has been drawn up, our house will be gone. 
the highway will take it. But that, I'm sure, will be after many, many years. I don't, I don't plant, I don't think, of course you never plant, you, you hope you live forever, enjoy life. But I don't believe it will be in my lifetime. So I will not, I don't think I will see what happens to this, this uh, property. Uh, but that's progress, so if that's the way it is. Could you? Talk about your reaction when the plant closed. What your thoughts and feelings were about the closure. I was so. Uh, I was when the plant closed. I was shocked. Uh, I knew. I was there on projects the day before it closed and nothing was said as far as I know the people that I was associated with had no idea of uh, that it was going to close uh -huh. and when I heard the next day that the plant had closed I, I just couldn't believe it you know I said why you know, and of course I knew that uh, there were problems, and uh, and I knew that uh, the Attorney General Mary Sue Terry had looking at it very hard, and, and I was sorry because I was. Uh, at that time, chairman of the Warren County Democratic Party. And I had campaigned for Mary Sue Terry. Uh, and various things, I had not actively, and I was uh, asked, I was on the Democratic State Committee, and was asked about Mary Sue coming to Front Royal or Warren County, I said, no way. <laughs> I don't think that that would be a wise decision, friend. To, uh, and of course, uh, a lot of people, I'm sure, told me that we, they felt that it was uh, political, it was there, but I don't know. I can't make a judgment because I don't know. I'm sure there must, there's two sides to it, you know. Things must have happened and that this caused. Them. And and I know that after that, uh, it seems to me there was a program by which uh, some organization was trying to help uh, people who were working at the plant at that time find jobs. I don't know the name of it, but uh, and I really don't know what happened to the people. I don't see or in my moving around. I don't don't see any plain people. But I guess they've gone to work at. And I'm sure they're situated now. I'm sure they all got jobs and uh, hopefully doing all right. You felt, I felt sorry for them all. I was retired and you know I was fine. But I really felt sorry because I could look back at the time when we were raising uh, children and paying for houses and cars and you know, when a paycheck was in, you know. And I know uh, we both worked. We were able to take care of the children. And uh, and I know today why both parents uh, 
need to work and since my my wife and I'll retire in uh, 83 I guess 84 and uh, she was a very good friend of the principal of E. Wilson Morrison School, Peggy Herman. And they talked me into going down to the school as a volunteer. So, I will say, since 1989, and I still did it today, I go to E. Wilson Morrison five days a week from 9 o'clock in the morning to 10.30, listening to first graders read, doing math with them, or whatever the teacher is, wants me to do. And uh, it, it's, it's a neat experience. It's a good way for a senior to start a day. I have, I have work to do here, but I just get up and let the work stay and go down, enjoy those youngsters every morning and I hope I can continue to it. How would you like to see the site, the, how would you like to see the land be reused under the plant? I would, let's say the only thing that, that I really have kept track of, of the land and that tax has been through the newspapers. And most of all the reports in the newspapers, I would say, were negative. And I have flown over two or three times with a, a friend who's a pilot rent a plane, fly around, look down. But I say whatever happens to the land, I hope it, it will be something that uh, will be beneficial to the people of Front Royal and Warren County. And something that they can be proud of and not associated with the negative publicity that Aptex has received. Is there anything important to you or in your life that that you would like to share uh, with the museum goers? Any philosophy or motto or creed or any beliefs that you feel uh, have helped you in your quality of life, in your outlook on life? Well, I say, <coughs> when I say my, I, I speak for my wife. We have, have always had a, a positive outlook. Uh, and we have raised our daughters to that way. We did not. Maybe we should wait. <laughs> I don't want to get this on the tape while you're talking. That is so beautiful. Your wife is such a wonderful artist. We did not have everything we wanted to start with. In fact, is when we moved into this house, we had one bed. And I did a lot of the refinishing, of the finishing, the painting and things like that. And we moved forward. We had a kerosene stove because when we were married in 46, a refrigerator refrigerator and stove were not to be had. Electric dirtiness. So when we lived in Flint Hill, we a neighbor who had been buried and well established allowed us to use a little section of the refrigerator 
and we purchased a kerosene stove. So when we moved here, so uh, we had a bed, we did have that piece of furniture there, uh, and we just moved forward from there on, adding what we felt that we could afford until we got, you know. So uh, I think the, maybe their philosophy might have, it could be different than what the uh, basic it is today. That, uh, maybe the, our young people feel like they, they need everything at one time. And it, it's, it's nice, you know, but uh, unless you have lots of money, <laughs> it's right hard. And, and you're always uh, looking to, to uh, making payments, and that's hard. It's hard thinking when you have to figure out so much for this, this month, and so much for that. And so I, we felt it was, it's much better to live with what we had until we could afford to do better. And we felt that we would achieve it, and we did. We have been blessed with good health, which is a, and I would say, first backtracking again, but the plant always carried wonderful health insurance on its employees. Wonderful health insurance. I know when you when you get out and start paying for it on your own, you realize what the term fringe benefits means, especially in the terms of health care. If you think of something at a later time, I can return and add it to your tape. <laughs> today, before I turn it off, it, does anything come to your mind, anything at all, that you feel like adding? I would say that list I kept on. Um, I remember we had one phone in the house, and the phone was in our dining room. And when they had people working with me around the clock, there was always, uh, as the girls would always tell me, Daddy, don't go to bed before the midnight shift goes on because you they're going to wake you up <laughs> so we had one phone in the dining room the room was sitting there phone would ring <laughs> and keep ringing until I would get there so finally years later said you need a phone by your bed <laughs> so and most of the time I could straighten out the problem on the phone. But a lot of times it was necessary for me to go to the plant to straighten out a machine uh, two or three o'clock in the morning, maybe spend the rest of the night there. But again, uh, I said, uh, it was part of the job, so I accepted it. It didn't hurt me. I, I got plenty of sleep. But this, the call list was kept up a bed, and, and I knew who was on break, who was working, who was on break. So if somebody had called that I'm sick, I can't go in tonight, I would look at my sheet and see who's on break. And regardless of what time of day or night it was, I would dial that number, you know. And the people were realized that they were 
subject to calls like that, you see. And if if the the person on break says they were they didn't have to come in there. It was on their own. But most of the time it did because it was time and a half time, you see. If they did, then I couldn't get somebody else. Then the person who was working would be forced to work the next shift, which we tried to keep from doing. And the people themselves, and say they were good about it, they didn't want to see somebody forced to work. And they would work and trade. And, and so that was this list of, of people that, that now, not, not all of these on this list was in the lab. This was all, so it was just about 30, 40 people maybe in the PT lab on that list. When you, but it was very important. When you stayed all night at work, did you just stay there and work your regular shift? Oh, no, I, I would come home and check in and help the wife see the children were off school and things like that, going back. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take it. Well, some nights you didn't get much rest. No, no. But the, when some of the children were born and raised, I didn't get much rest either. <laughs> <laughs>